Next on the Broadway show, Great Scott, Back to the Future and the DeLorean arrive on Broadway. You'll meet the Tony winner who plays Doc Brown, Roger Bart. Plus, we're celebrating two more star-studded opening nights on Broadway, David Burns' Here Lies Love and the new comedy from director Jason Alexander, The Cottage. I'm Tamsin Fidel, and this is The Broadway Show. The Broadway Show is back with another stacked episode. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get started. We're celebrating another star-studded opening night on Broadway. It's The Cottage, the hilarious and star-studded new play featuring a ton of top Broadway talent and an SNL alum. Plus, it's directed by Tony winner and TV icon Jason Alexander. We hit the red carpet. Roads, where we're going, we don't need roads. Back to the Future, the musical is on Broadway this summer. Let's send it out to Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. I'm at Citizen M Hotel, high above Back to the Future, talking to Roger Bart, who has taken on the iconic role of Doc Brown. Roger. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Look at you back on Broadway in another big musical, big yeah. Broadway musical. Yeah. I saw it last night, loved it. Fantastic, had a great time. But what I loved about it was how many people, regular people, you could just tell it was one of those shows that when families heard that this was coming to Broadway, it was like, we're, we're getting tickets to that. There's just certain titles that people get really excited about. Yeah, it, 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 you know, Back to the Future, as I, I became more and more familiar with it over these years working on it, I underestimated its um, huge appeal and it's the way it's, uh, it, it is as famous as uh, if we were to do a Star Wars musical or E.T. Sure. the musical, and most Spielberg giant ventures. It's of that epic, epic size, you know, so uh, uh, it is not an, an unusual night for me to, um, to look out in the audience and see three people dressed as Doc Brown with with, uh, with ridiculous wigs. But Back to the Future has a great human story under it all. It does. I mean, it, it is sort of based in sci-fi and time travel and all these sort of big ideas, but it actually is just a beautiful human story about family and friendship yep. and love, and yeah. it's just lovely. It, it, it really is. It's The show is, is it's kind of constructed, like a, it bookended and, and interspersed with um, a lot of uh, uh, very cool technology yeah. um, that is very cool, state of the, the art. I mean, yes. really, really very cool. Um, and in the middle of it is an old fashioned uh, 1955 story. And of course, what's interesting for us is that, you know, uh, Marty and I uh, have this uh, motor of, uh, we only have a, this amount of time yeah. and it's life or death. Yeah. And meanwhile, we're, we're, we're around a world that has no idea. They're just sort of a day in the life in 1955 of a, of a kid who's obsessed with a girl and uh, it would love nothing more than to spend the rest of his life with her. I also think it really works because the movie, when you think back, so many of the performances were so big and theatrical, like Crispin Glover and uh, Christopher Lloyd, yeah. obviously, is Doc Brown. You're not tasked with giving us Christopher Lloyd. Right. But I feel like I got to see such a beautiful, different characterization yeah. of, of this sort of mad scientist uh, yeah. guy that we all loved in the 80s. The only thing that I tried to adhere to, which was the great um, leg up from Christopher Lloyd, was Chris has that kind of unique ability to be able to be both uh, charming and also make an audience feel like anything can happen. He's, mm. He could do anything to surprise you. He's going to do something crazy. And those are things that I uh, love. You know, I love, I love to be both um, a little subversive on stage with the audience um, and also um, create a feeling of, uh, of, of, of controlled chaos. The audiences lose their minds at this show. This is like one of the most enthusiastic audiences I've seen in years. I yeah, mean, really, they're ready for this and it, I feel yeah. like you're the ringmaster to sort of keep this party going. Uh, this is probably the closest thing to, to being in, in Rocky Horror that I'll ever sure. get in a weird way because they do they do know where the key story moments are and they are behind it in a way that is not um, obligatory or perfunctory. It's more that they really are involved. They really do organically yeah. get excited when, when 
when George finally takes Biff out. Yeah. We had a really interesting moment in the development of the show where we had written the first song that I sing called It Works about the car, the DeLorean. And um, it was given to me and I kind of thought, we need background vocals, man. We need we need people to kind of bop behind me, you know? And we were like, well, where, where are they? Where are they going to come from at right. 1.15 in the morning in a mall parking lot, you know? So I, so I threw out a couple of ideas that were unseemly um, about where the, who they could be. Um, and then they were like, oh, they should just be really kind of, you know, hot girls in DeLorean outfits. And I was like, well, that's interesting. So so if they're going to emerge out of nowhere, then I have the opportunity. I said, well, we should just throw in the line of, you know, where they come from. Is I, I don't know. They, they just show up whenever yeah. I start singing. When, when we introduce that, um, that oh, that key element to the audience. I think it kind of made it, it made the show self-aware mm -hmm. in a way. It put a lot of them like, oh, <laughs> they they know it's silly too. Like we all accept that it's yeah. this is a silly convention. Yeah. And then we ran with it. Matter of fact, I sing a really sweet ballad at one point, and I begged John Rando to have just a group show up at my door singing ooze and just saying, please, really, I just stop it. Just leave me alone. <laughs> Nobody said you can't yeah. do it. But I wanted them everywhere. As soon as yeah. I start singing anything, yeah. you know, just show up. So it's really fun. It's another must-see show and another star-shutted opening night on Broadway. The music of David Byrne is back on Broadway in Here Lies Love. It's a decade in the making, and it's the totally immersive Broadway production about the former first lady of the Philippines, Amelda Marcos. And Here Lies Love is the first Broadway show ever to feature an all-Filipino cast. We hit the red carpet opening night. It means the world to me that we have an all-Filipino company on Broadway and that this is the first time anything like this has ever happened. What I am hoping for is that more people of color in this community, in this global artistic community here on Broadway, can look at this as an example for what is possible. That there be more stories and that there be much more inclusivity and representation. And if we could do it, it gives permission to everybody else. My dad just flew in this morning and uh, I just dropped him off at the hotel before coming to see you. And um, the fact that I get to tell a story about a country that he was born in and that I am connected to as well. And it just feels like I'm getting to connect to my roots in a way that I've never been able to before. The show is a big dancing disco party. And we tell the story of Imelda Marcos uh, and her rise and fall and I play the president. But it's the rise and fall of the dictatorship in the Philippines um, and told in a really fun and disco way. There is a dance floor that you can be part of, that you can stand on, but there are also galleries on the side where you can view and the um, the mezzanine and rear mezzanine where you can have even an even different experience. So our job is to tell the story to everyone in the space, to make everyone feel like they're a part of it, like they're a part of a political rally or a wedding party or a, a funeral, you know, so we, we take them through all of the emotions in this incredible roller coaster to ride um, while giving them a history lesson. Let's send it out to Charlie Cooper. Ariel, we're going to work. We're we so are. close to the Broadway theater. I know. So you're leading as Imelda Marcos, and here lies love, which as a Filipino woman, what does this like show mean to you? Yeah, well, this is, you know, the first Filipino cast on Broadway. Mm -hmm. First Filipino, all Filipino cast like anywhere, probably. Huge. Um, in the US. And we're telling a Filipino story and we're telling like the history of what happened in the Philippines. And so for me, I feel a big responsibility and people are coming for the party and it is a party. Yeah. But it's also so much more than that. And so it leaves people feeling really hopeful and empowered. And as a Filipino, I feel like I'm connecting to my roots again because my family came to the US when my mom was still a teenager. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really talk about this family history. Really? And now I've learned so much more about it. And I'm getting to tell this story every night. And so many Filipinos after the show are just you know, in tears because yeah. they feel like they're being represented on stage. And they feel like their children are getting to learn about their history and also being inspired to seeing other people who look like them. I have to know, have your family come out and see, 
seen it yet. What has their response been? Yeah, my mom came my very first show, first uh, preview, yeah. and she was just blown away. She was in love with the show and just so proud. When I told her I was gonna be a Melda Marcos, she was crying <laughs> because <laughs> This is the first time I've played a Filipino character. A lot of us in the show, we we haven't had the opportunity to do that. Right. So, getting to finally play a Filipino as a Filipino, like I get to claim it and to like, really tell the world that this is who I am, and it's so exciting. What does that feel like to work with so many people who look like you, and maybe there may be little nuances that you guys understand because you you understand? Yeah. Totally. There's, I mean, there's definitely like uh, mannerisms and stuff. I find myself channeling a lot of the mannerisms of my mom and my grandma in my performance as Imelda. I, love that. I don't tell her I said that. <laughs> She'll hear it. <laughs> this is your first time playing a leading lady, and I have to know what is your secret? How do you land those leading lady roles? Oh my gosh. What is your leading lady secret sauce? My leading lady <laughs> secret sauce. Be nice Love that. and believe in yourself and believe that you can do anything and have really positive self-talk and know that you're, I feel like your dreams are all prophecies mm. and anything is possible. So good. So, so good. And speaking of so good, listen, we're here at the Broadway Theater yes. and it's time to go to we work. Made it. Yes. We made it. I'll let you go in, break a leg, thank and you. thank you. Thanks so much. A whole lot more coming up next on The Broadway Show. A new comedy solo show is now on Broadway. I'm Paul Wontorek, talking to Alex Edelman. Hi, my name is Zan Bruby, and I play Anne Boleyn on the national tour of Six. And we're coming to Madison, Wisconsin, August 1st through the 6th. And you're watching The Broadway Show. Thanks for staying with us for this latest edition of The Broadway Show. Glad you're here. Alex Edelman's Just For Us is now on Broadway. It's Alex's one-man show, exploring anti-Semitism and his Jewish roots. But it's way funnier than that description. Let's go ahead and check back in with Paul Wontorek. Thanks, Tamsin. Comedian Alex Edelman's solo show, Just For Us, is now playing at the Hudson Theater. I sat down with Broadway's newest star. Alex, here we are. The Hudson Theater. This is one of the fanciest venues. I mean, if you look at the book, What do you mean one of? This is the fanciest The theater. fanciest. Recently renovated. Yeah. How are you feeling? I mean, you've played venues all over the world. It's the oldest Broadway theater, weirdly, and the newest, which is like a nice little yep. technicality. Firstly, the owner of the theater died in the Titanic. You don't have time for this, but like eventually they did the Tonight Show here and Comedy Central did their present series here. And so it has some serious comedy credentials and I loved those Comedy Central presents. And so yeah, yeah. this is I think their first comedy um, yeah. sort of show with great respect to Neil Simon, who is a comedy genius. Yes. But, uh, but yeah, it's a very salubrious environment <laughs> for a comedian. People are eating up this show of yours. I, I sat in this house last night. People, the laughs are plentiful. You are so good at working an audience. I just love watching someone with, with that skill set who I've never, I've never seen you live before. You know, that's the interesting thing about Broadway. Like somebody drops into the Broadway landscape and Broadway sort of can accommodate a lot of different kinds of shows, so it's cool. I think to say that it's been embraced by Broadway audiences. Yeah. Been, Broadway audiences have really found their way to the show and it's been this wonderful thing, not just by the way, the audiences, but also like the casts of various shows like Parade and Sidney Brewstein's Window and Goodnight Oscar have all yeah. sort of sent their best wishes. And it really is a wonderful community. And I was walking around the other day between shows and I ran into a buddy of mine who's in, who's working on the One More Time show. And like, uh -huh. it feels like a campus. Yeah. And so that's been really nice. And yeah, the audiences have been bananas. It is so cool, so wonderful. I'm learning so much about Broadway. I'm embarrassed of my blind spots. I've got a lot of blind spots. I thought Sondheim was a tiny horse. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but like, I love, uh, I love all the stuff that I'm experiencing and learning. And it, it's, if you can't tell from the show, I love a new environment. And so this has been like the most special 
adventure and the fact that re reviewers and audiences and other artists have found their way to the show and enjoyed it, that it really has been, it's the most wonderful thing. We are dealing with a real thing that happened to you. What year did this actually? End of 2017, beginning of 2018. Okay. Mm -hmm. You somehow found yourself in a um, an apartment in Queens, mm -hmm. surrounded by a bunch of white nationalists. Yeah, that's what I call them. Or Nerf Nazis, you call them in the show. I call them Nerf Nazis, yeah. You're very clear about uh, the specifics of, of words and words matter and mm -hmm. right, descriptives and it a and it's it the whole show is sort of built around this. How how long were you actually in this room? I think like almost two hours. Wow. Okay. Was yeah. there any point where you thought like this could be a show on Broadway at the Hudson after Jessica? Chastain's yeah, man, done? absolutely, for sure. <laughs> I didn't even think it was a show. I just started telling it to friends to try to make them laugh. And then my friend Danny was like, that might be stand up. And then my director, Adam, was like, that might be the backbone of your show. That's why I talk to people, because I'm not smart enough to figure out anything on my own. I think curiosity is like my defining characteristic. I love to find new things. And, and that's why I talk to people also, is because what if, what if someone has the answer? I don't know the question, but what if you accidentally find the answer? If you walk through Times Square, you've probably seen or even chatted with members of the Chicago The Musical Dance Mob. The iconic street team made up of some amazing singers and dancers, many of whom have big Broadway dreams of their own. Let's send it out to Perry Sook. Thanks, Jansen. Chicago may be the longest running American musical, but almost as long running is their partnership with promoter Theater Mama. I'm about to head to Times Square to meet one of the members of the Chicago Dance Mob. All right, so I'm here in the middle of Times Square with a longtime member of the Chicago Dance Mob, Chelsea Logan. Chelsea, how long have you been a Chicago girl? I've been about 10 years. I'll be celebrating 10 years in June. What goes into it? You know, are you Fosse trained? What is the rigorous dance training to, to get the position? Or what goes into a day? We do have to audition for the position. So we have uh, like yearly auditions, also sometimes bi-yearly, depending on the demand. Mm -hmm. uh, so I auditioned for it. And then we do have a uh, yearly training oh, wow. that we have to go to just to practice our Fosse poses, kind of keep us all like on the same base level. I wasn't dance trained, I'm physical theater trained. So oh, wow. I, it was a whole new experience for me. <laughs> I was like, whoa, this is different. I learned that it's not really dancing. It's more like moving from Fosse pose to Fosse pose. Sure. Because obviously we're out here for up to 10 hours a day. So we can't really be like living our true Broadway life. <laughs> and then yeah, we're out here in Times Square. It's our office. Uh, we're here for <laughs> 10 hours a day and we just meet tons of people various kinds of people and give them discounts for the show or we hit up TKTS and promote the TKTS discount. So what are your Broadway dreams? Broadway, I would love to be in an original Broadway like play, original cast. I think that plays, especially on Broadway, kind of get overlooked by musicals. And I think that they sometimes have some of the most intense stories. Where I would like to be is something that is going to sit, make someone sit with a problem and like look at the world through different eyes. Welcome back to the Broadway show. I'm Tamsin Fidel. Let's get back to it. It's my life. It's now or never. For Juliet, there is life after Romeo. But for Ben Jackson Walker, his Broadway career begins right here in the pop musical Smash and Juliet. And he's this week's fresh face. <laughs> Hey, I'm Ben Jackson Walker. I'm playing Romeo, and this is Anne Juliet. It's crazy that to say this is my Broadway debut, and it's an original musical, but when I say, hey, I'm playing Romeo, everyone's like, oh wait, you're playing Romeo? And I'm like, it's not exactly what you think, but it's a really, really fun take on it. My first show I ever did was a musical version of The Hobbit, and I played Frodo Baggins, and they made me these like, giant feet that were like stuffed with like stuffing from like a pillow and they had me in like an Annie wig. <laughs> Weirdly enough, I like really caught the bug then because it was absolutely exhilarating and absolutely terrifying to me and I've like, I've kept chasing that ever since. I never had a backup plan, but when I got to the city, I've done a bunch of different things and I kind of ended on like nannying and during the pandemic I was gardening and I went to Hawaii for three months and homeschooled two little girls. But I think coming back from the pandemic and when things kind of started to happen and I kind of settled into my life in New York, I was like, it's, it, it was always this. I, I mean, I dreamed of 
these kinds of things. I, you know, would lay in bed listening to music and I would like think these things through. But you can't actually like know what it's gonna be like or what it's gonna feel like until you're there in that moment and you're doing it. I just have to take it one day at a time because it's overwhelming and it's amazing. Hi, I'm Jason Alexander and you're watching The Broadway Show. That's all for now. I'll see you next time. I'm Tamsin Fidel and this is The Broadway Show.